Thanks for joining us to our fall 2020 virtual open house. So this is our engineering information session for the University of Hart Hartford. And we are part of the College of Engineering, Technology and Architecture, or what we would call CEDA. I think you've made a great choice in joining us because we're gonna tell you about our awesome programs here at the University of Hartford. All right. So, why is the University of Hartford the place to go for an undergraduate engineering education? Because we got the best winning formula around. Uh, I think number one is our student-faculty interaction. We here, we like students, we like teaching about undergraduate en engineering. Uh, it's what makes us want to come to work, is the fact that we get to interact with our students, not only while you're here for your four years, but also well into your careers. Uh, for most of us, or not all of us, that when we get to get that email from you after you've been in the field for whether it's five years, 10 years into your career, you know, it's an exciting part of our day to see how successful our students are doing uh, in their careers. So it's, it's an opportunity for us to get to know you in those four years. And we really, you know, appreciate that uh, opportunity. Uh, with that, we have a lot of industrial partnerships, uh, which is very key because in the end, we're a means to an end. We really want you to find a career that you're passionate about. And in order to do that, you have to understand what are my opportunities out there. So that's how we handle this with our industry partners. Many of the faculty at the University of Hartford have worked as practicing professionals. So we have very good networking relationship with a strong group of industries and the greater Hartford area, and then also through our alumni in the New York and Boston areas. Internships are a key part of your education. Uh, many times these are done during the summer. It gives you a real feel for what would you do as a engineer in the field? And is this area that I think I'm interested in really the one that's fit for me? And we really help you work hard with you from your first year as freshman uh, about different in internship opportunities uh, because that's a key part of your education. And then all of this is wrapped together is because you need those solid engineering fundamentals to make it work. And so these are our four keys to what we think provides you the place to go is the University of Hartford for an undergraduate education, engineering education. And I personally think you made a great decision to join us tonight and hopefully you'll decide to join us next fall. So before I can talk too long or speak too much, what I'd like to do is turn it over to some of our best faculty to talk about what they do uh, and how they interact with both their students, with their industry partners, and what makes the education here at Hartford special. And as you probably know, if you haven't heard this already, engineering is hard work. We will challenge you. You're gonna have plenty of late nights with your friends working on projects. But I think all in all, what's very important to recognize is we're gonna have fun together. Uh, we make this fun, it is hard, it is challenging, but you're gonna have a good time here at the University of Hartford and you're gonna learn an awful lot and we hope kick off the career that you're passionate about. So I've got six excellent faculty members with me tonight to talk about their areas. But before I do that, I also like to introduce you to a few of our students who are joining us tonight. We have Gabby, who is a biomed and biomedical engineer, who's also on our women's soccer team. We have Sean, who is a mechanical engineer. We have another Sean, who is a mechanical engineer with an acoustics concentration. And we have Eva, who's an acoustical, engin acoustical engineering and music student. And her specialty is the trombone. Uh, so you'll get to understand what more of those different uh, programs are, what the opportunities are at the University of Hartford, amongst our other uh, engineering programs also. And I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Professor Todd Brown to discuss civil engineering. And Professor Brown has actually worked in the civil engineering industry for 25 plus years and brings a wealth of industrial experience to the role, his role as a faculty member. Thanks, Todd. Hey, thank you, Dave. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to uh, not meet you in person, but I Hope to do that when you join us. Um, but today, I'm, as Dave said, I am Professor Todd Brown. I am an applied assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering. 
And that word applied refers to the fact that as, as you mentioned, I have over 30 years of practicing, uh, of experience as a practicing engineer, mostly in the consulting engineering business uh, before I joined the university four years ago. And one of the main reasons the university employs people like me is because we bring a large network of colleagues and clients um, who are, who in my experience have been very willing to help me and help our students learn about the profession that they're about to enter. And that's a huge benefit to your learning experience. As you see on the right hand side of this slide, there's a photograph of one of my classes uh, taking a tour where one of my professional colleagues, Ray, is giving them an in-depth tour of his clean water treatment facility in Manchester, Connecticut. And on the tour, Ray likes to point out to the students, and I ask him to point out as many of the little details as he can that make it an easy plant to operate and maintain. Because as a process design engineer in, the, in this field, you need to listen to the people that are operating these facilities when you're designing them so that you end up with a design that is workable uh, and that meets their needs. <clears throat> so, one of the things I try to focus on as a professor is teaching you students things that I wish I knew when I graduated from college many years ago. Uh, and I think the students that have left our program and have contacted me since they left really appreciate that because um, they have at least a clue of what they're getting into when they get into their careers. But the civil engineering program in general provides you all with a broad base of all the sub-disciplines of civil engineering geotechnical, transportation, structures, environmental, construction. Um, and then in your senior year, you can choose professional electives and a capstone project to help you explore in greater depth one of those sub-disciplines. And two of the sub-disciplines offer official concentrations as indicated on the slide. We do, as Dr. Pine said, take a great deal of pride in knowing each of you as individuals. Um, and we'd like to watch you succeed. Our courses, several, several, several of our courses involve projects where you work in teams to solve engineering problems. Uh, in many cases, these teams can go out to work outside the classroom with some of these professionals that I've been talking about. Um, well, the the four-year program culminates with a capstone design project. And that capstone design project um, is a real world pro project that is brought to us by a professional mentor. And the team that gets put together includes the faculty member, um, a professional mentor, and a student team of three or four students who are working on the project. The professional mentor brings the project to the table, provides all the background information, including survey information usually, um, a problem statement and some, some background data. And then the students have to analyze that data, come up with some alternatives for solving the problem that was presented to them. And then they work with both their faculty advisor and the professional mentor to, that, to talk about their recommendations and focus them onto a, a design project. And then each member of the team is then responsible to design a particular part of that um, project. And they meet with the faculty advisor every week and with a professional mentor any, anywhere from three to 10 times a semester. I've got a couple of professional mentors who love to come in and meet with the students and they're there every week to talk to the students about their project and share their real world experience with them. This slide pre presents some examples of those capstone projects that we've worked on in the past several years. Um, and as I mentioned, because they are real projects, they all involve multiple sub-disciplines. So even though you might be working on a clean water treatment facility, which is uh, what we'd like to call wastewater treatment facilities now, um, you might do the process work of an environmental engineer, but you also have to include geotechnical engineering, structural engineering, uh, and we also involve electrical and mechanical engineers in a real project. Uh, but the students get to see how these different disciplines work together when they work on a project like this. So uh, without further ado, I guess that's all I have to say. And if uh, when we get to the end of the session, if you have specific questions related to civil, uh, we'll put them in the Q&A and 
I'd be happy to answer them for you. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Todd. So as you can see by a slide, there's some really cool different types of projects as a civil engineer you can work on at the University of Hartford. And once again, these are all real projects. These projects have been done by consultants. So as a student, you get that real engineering experience so that when you graduate and enter the workforce, you're ready to go and ready to, you know, start kick off a really successful career. So moving on to biomedical engineering, I'd like to introduce Dr. Asaki. He's one of our young, very energetic faculty members who really excites their students. Uh, looks like Gabby is also showing her face. She's smiling. She's one of our biomedical engineering students. Uh, so take it away. Hi, uh, this is Dr. Saki, and I'm an assistant professor of biomedical engineering. And uh, everybody welcome to the University of Hartford. And uh, our biomedical engineering program is not big. It's actually the, one of the smaller program in the CETA program. So in other words, student, and professors, uh, we are always you know, together and uh, we always closely work together. So Gabby can comment a little bit about how close we are. And our biomedical projects or biomedical you know, activities are based on you know, the medical and health science aspects as well as the basic science aspects and engineering aspects. So three major areas coming into one is our biomedical focus. And uh, we are trying to work better society and then better make you know, our life better, any, any directions. So the first left pictures, you know, the, on the top one, students you know, standing outside, it's actually we are testing the radio communications of patient monitoring systems. So that's one unique aspects student can go out, outside and measure it. Now, middle picture is almost students sleeping, but actually he's not sleeping. Actually, he's relaxing to pick it up the muscle signal. So that's another, we are trying to capture the muscle activities, translate to the computers, and we can utilize as some more useful way. So, Next slide, uh, the, she's holding the weights and then smiling. Actually, she's playing a game. So using muscle signals to control the game. So actually, she's playing the same you know, Xbox, PlayStation kind of game, but she's using only muscle activities. So we, our project is more wide range, wide activities. So the down below the class 2020, which is just graduate last May, and look at the 12, 13, 14 students in the class, and that's the pretty much size of the class. And uh, our projects, as well as our internship class, always associate or work with Hangar Clinic, that's the prosthetic company, and the Medtronic, that's the big medical device company down in North Haven. And uh, Oxford Performance Materials, another material company for testing tissue engineering aspects, other aspects. And many local clinics, local hospitals, Hartford, you know, healthcare, and a Yukon uh, Health, Yukon Health Center, and uh, Trinity Health. That's actually the St. Francis Hospital, and uh, Shriners Hospital in Springfield. So we have wide range of collaborations. So next slide, please. So here is another aspects of our project and uh, that's how we are doing. So yeah, we can comment a little bit after that. So she, she was actually in middle of the pictures. So we have always three, two or three student groups and we work for the capstone projects. In uh, 2018 students, they work on the looking at smart helmet. So the typical traditional helmet is transferred something more useful, more smart aspects to it. 
And actually that was one of the you know, good project and uh, it's carrying on for the next years. In uh, 2019, we had different aspects, some of them using the CAD software to capture the fingers and to make it nice the spin and using 3D printers. So that's simple project, but actually it's not a simple project. Making a three dimensional hand and capturing into the CAD software is not simple. In other groups, we did the vibrotactile, the sensation testing device. So some students, I brought three of them to the Yukon Health Center to do vibration measurement. And that's the lower picture measurement at Yukon Health Center is what they're doing. Now, another project example is the Drossy Goodwin Scholarship Project. This is the, one of the university scholarship project and we had the activities. So it's not necessarily capstone. We have many different ways to do some projects. So down below, the design development by Rotacta finger testing. So this is more finger sensation test. In lower left, it's too tiny, too small, but actually showing receptor of the fingers. So the some receptors of the fingers are not sensitive for different type of vibration. So we develop, we design the new type of device to test sensation of the fingers. So the lower senior design project review day for 2019, this is two students presenting in front of professors. Now, because we are small and we are kind of get nice friendly you know, presentations, but still we're gonna get into the engineering details. So right picture, maybe this is Gabby, you can jump in. Uh, we had Biomedical Engineering Society national conference every year. And then last year, those uh, eight, nine, uh, actually eight students went to the BMS conference, they presented something. So some of students are juniors, some students are seniors. And then even Gabby presented not University Hartford projects, she was working on North Carolina projects, which she did in summer internship project. So that's another aspects uh, we have, you know, we deal with. And uh, this biomedical engineering conference is really big, actually biggest national conference and an actually international conference. So look at the, everybody's pictures and they are smiling and uh, they surprise how big the biomedical engineering field is and how exciting the conference is. So Gabby, do you have any comments about the BMES conference? Yeah, so we actually, so Dr. Saki is like the student volunteer coordinator for the Biomedical Engineering Society conference. Um, so a lot of students get to, to volunteer. Um, there are a lot of booths where you can talk to a lot of different grad schools and a lot of companies, but we also do a lot of networking on campus. So we talk to we can talk to people on campus and then we meet up with a bunch of alumni that we meet at the national conference so it's really good to ex not only expand our network but to keep in touch with the people that we do already know um, so it was a really great experience we had like a record number of students attending and of course biomedical engineering is a relatively new field but it's it's always been relevant because it has to do with humans and we're making things that humans are using every day. So it's never going to not be in demand. Um, and so that's something that really excites me about being a biomedical engineering major. Um, it's extremely broad. And so you're never going to get bored because there's so many areas that you can get into, like our capstones where we can do, um, there's a project where they're detecting cancer using your saliva. And then my project is, growing stem cells and trying to turn that into your spinal cord. Um, and there, we also have a lot of industry sponsored um, capstone projects that we can't really disclose to you because they are sponsored, but a lot of these projects lead to full-time offers. 
Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, guys. So I just like to say the biomeds do their road trips when road trips can be done again. So it's great that they got to go to the national conference together. That's a great opportunity for undergraduate students. Also, uh, what's really cool is through almost all of our disciplines is that not only do you do the design, but building a prototype is also an important part of your capstone project experience. And there's definitely a lot to be learned when you actually try to bring to life whatever your design and ideas are. So thank you guys. On thank to you. mechanical engineering. Uh, we're gonna have Dr. Sai Yavuzturk uh, talk about our mechanical engineering program. And Sai's area is sustainability, which is obviously of ultimate importance today and discussing about renewable energy. Those are his areas of interest, especially ge geothermal systems. Um, All right. so take it away, Dr. Yavuzturk. Oh, thank you, thank you, Dave. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Sai Wusterk. I'm the chair of the Mechanical Engineering Department. Uh, we have one of the larger departments in the college. In fact, one of the largest, one of the larger departments uh, on the entire campus. And uh, fundamentally, mechanical engineering is a discipline uh, within engineering that uh, utilizes, applies uh, fundamental physics, fundamental principles of physics, mathematics, and material science that also handshakes with chemistry, obviously, uh, to design, analyze, manufacture uh, mechanical systems and maintain mechanical systems. It's a, it's a fairly multidisciplinary, uh, uh, you know, subsection of subdiscipline of engineering, and it, it crosses over into a multitude of areas, and uh, that's why you know, just to just to illustrate uh, what mechanical engineering is really uh, in terms of its multidisciplinary nature, I ended up putting that uh, Swiss Army knife there. Uh, uh, that's that's us. <laughs> the areas uh, within mechanical engineering are turbo machinery, manufacturing, uh, robotics. Uh, we have energy and sustain energy engineering and sustainability, uh, materials engineering, and, and acoustics. So, in the next slide, uh, uh, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. All these pictures that you see uh, are uh, not exactly maybe the pictures of capstone projects that our students worked on, but uh, projects that are related to uh, the capstone projects that, that our students do work on. And you'll also see uh, pictures of our students uh, working on those actual projects. It, within mechanical engineering, we offer uh, an, a number of uh, areas of concentration. An area of concentration is, uh, is something, it's an optional thing. It, you may or may not select a concentration, but it's an area where you decide to specialize, uh, learn more about uh, that particular uh, subsection, subdiscipline of mechanical engineering. In our department, we offer a concentration in acoustics. Uh, we offer a concentration in simulation and computational mechanical engineering that handshakes, uh, shakes hand with computer science, obviously. The concentration in energy engineering sustainability, <clears throat> a concentration in manufacturing, robotics, and, and turbo machinery. And I'm gonna talk about these uh, I'm gonna give you a couple more sentences uh, about each one of these. Uh, in my next slides. Starting this fall, uh, we are also starting a, a, a brand new major actually in aerospace engineering. And uh, hopefully pretty soon our department uh, will not just be a, the, the mechanical engineering department, but also uh, the uh, mechanical aerospace and acoustical engineering department. Anyway, a, a few quick facts about mechanical uh, engineers. Uh, uh, 
based on the statistics from the U.S. Uh, uh, Bureau of Labor, uh, in 2019, the median pay for mechanical engineers uh, was about $87,000. You know, typical entry-level education is the Bachelor's of Science degree in mechanical engineering. That's the four-year degree that we offer here. We do offer master's degrees as well. Uh, the number of jobs that were available in 2019, about 320,000 jobs uh, on the market and the, based on the Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics, uh, they're, they're predicting about a 4% 4, 4 growth per annum, uh, that, that market to grow. Median starting salary is about somewhere between 62 and $65,000. That's, you know, you know, fresh mechanical engineer who's just completed uh, the four-year degree. One thing that we take pride in, uh, and this is a trend that we've been observing for a long time now, over 90% of our uh, mechanical engineering graduates uh, have secured uh, employment at the time of their graduation. That's, that's a fairly, fairly good uh, and a fairly high rate of employment. Uh, our programs are ABET accredited. Uh, ABET is the highest uh, level of accreditation that, that, that one engineering program could, could achieve. And uh, obviously we take pride in that as well. So in the next slides, very quickly, uh, I'm gonna sort of talk to you about the types of projects that, that you might be working on uh, in your capstone. And, uh, and I, we put down the logos of the companies where our uh, uh, graduates end up working. Uh, so if you decide to pursue, for example, the turbo machinery design concentration, you'll be designing aerospace systems, jet engines, steam turbines, and, and power generation equipment. And you may end up working for Skorsky, uh, Pratt & Whitney, or General Dynamics. Uh, in fact, these companies uh, are uh, sponsors of our capstone design projects. One, one other thing that we take pride in in mechanical engineering is the fact that all of our capstone design projects have the uh, industry sponsors. It's not like professors just sitting around and you know, making a project. It's actual uh, uh, real world projects that, that come to us and our students end up working with their in industry sponsors. Uh, the capstone design course is taken in the, in the senior year, obviously, and it ends up, for a lot of our students, it ends up becoming a nine-month-long uh, internship or a nine-month-long uh, job interview. You know, a lot of our students have been pretty much hired, uh, you know, right after they've completed their capstone design projects. So in the next slide, uh, the manufacturing concentration. So if you pursue this concentration, you'll be, uh, you know, dealing with uh, projects where you have to design the product itself, select the materials, uh, design the processes uh, to convert them into finished products. And uh, obviously shakes hands with automation and robotics as well. The next slide, uh, uh, materials, you know, obviously very fundamental, fundamental to mechanical engineering. Uh, the widgets, the, the subsystems, the things that we build, uh, they're, they're all either metals, plastics, ceramics, or, or, or some other composite materials. So we have to have a fantastic uh, you know, understanding of them. Uh, in the next slide, I believe uh, we talk about the energy conversion and sustainability concentration. Uh, this is an area, this happens to be my area of expertise. Uh, it's, uh, it's about uh, energy utilization. It's about utilization of energy, not only from uh, fossil fuels, uh, uh, hydroelectric systems, conventional s nuclear systems, but also uh, utilization of energy from renewable energy sources, uh, solar, wind, uh, geothermal, uh, ocean, uh, the concentration, uh, and you know, students pursuing this concentration end up working on such projects, but also it includes uh, heating, ventilating, air conditioning systems and uh, H HVAC systems that control 
uh, climates and homes, offices, industrial plants, but also, you know, systems that control processes, uh, thermal conditions of the processes and plants. In the next uh, <clears throat> slide, I believe we have, yeah, the robotics concentration. We have started this one about uh, three years ago now. Uh, uh, is a student working in this in this area? Your capstone design project will be related to automating machinery for assembly, transportation, or measurement. You'll be working on projects uh, dealing with machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, uh, localization and mapping systems, for example. And uh, I think the last slide uh, talks about. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, that's it. So that's perfect because that's uh, the acoustic. Uh, we also have an acoustics concentration with the mechanical engineering, and that's where we uh, where we dovetail with uh, what uh, Dr. Bob Selmer is going to talk about. Thank you. I look forward to talking to you after the presentations are done, and look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thanks. That's Thanks. one backwards Thanks. one, Dave. What's that? Let me. Backwards. Backwards. To, to one. To uh, keep going. Keep going. Right there. All right. Yeah. Hi. Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Bob Selmer. Oops. One more forward. Yeah, sorry. There we are. All right. So in our acoustical engineering realm, we actually have two different ways that you can pursue a career in the field of acoustical engineering. You can do the Bachelor of Science in Engineering with acoustical engineering and music like Eva is doing with her classical trombone as her specialty. And we also have the Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering with an acoustics concentration like Sean Bradley is doing right now. So both of them I'm sure will be able to help with questions at any point uh, today. Both programs are ABET accredited. So that's the national accrediting for engineering and technology programs. So back one. Yeah, I'm sorry, Bob. <laughs> Oh. Hmm. Okay, stay on this slide just for a sec. What I want to point out here just before we move on is that what the coursework prepares you for over the four years is actually six different areas of acoustics. So when you come in the door, you don't actually have to decide which of these six areas you want to do because you'll actually learn about all six as you progress through your coursework. And by the time you get to about junior year or so, you'll have a pretty good idea of what each of these areas are about and which is the one that you'd like to pursue, especially for your senior capstone projects. So the six are audio design, architectural acoustics, musical acoustics, environmental acoustics, bioacoustics and hearing, and product noise control. So let's take them one at a time. Okay, for audio design, we're not talking about doing recording. This is not a recording program. This is actually designing loudspeakers, designing microphones, designing audio components for systems. And on each of these slides, I've only put logos where our graduates have actually gone for projects, uh, for full-time employment and summer internships. So perhaps you recognize some of these logos like Bose, which is right up there in Framingham, Massachusetts. We've had graduates go to work there. Uh, Jack Breton actually uh, did a summer internship there this past summer. And in fact, we are right now having discussions with Bose. We're going to do a project with uh, uh, Bose loudspeakers this coming spring. And we're just putting the final details on exactly what that senior project will be all about. And I think Jack Breton will certainly be involved in that. Uh, Shure is a microphone company. They're in Chicago area. QSC makes uh, rack-mounted amplifiers. Uh, Apple, I'm sure you recognize that logo. They're out in California. And one of our recent graduates, Jared Lagler, uh, is doing things like voice recognition by Siri and uh, more awesome earbuds, uh, things like that. The last item here, Lucasfilm is perhaps famous for their visual things like Industrial Light and Magic but they've actually done quite a bit with sound. And one of our graduates from our program, Marco D'Ambrosio is his name, actually was on the team 
that came up with the THX sound system standard that maybe you've seen in movie theaters or in home audio equipment. So that's one possible area of that you could pursue. Next slide. Architectural acoustics. So this would be everything indoors, designing concert halls, designing recording studios, designing uh, worship spaces, you know, whether it's a mosque, a temple, or a church, you know, what the preacher wants, what the choir director wants are two different things acoustically, but you can actually make them both happy in the same space if you know what you're doing, and that's part of what we design. Privacy between dwellings, whether it be apartments, condominiums, hotel rooms, and in places like New York City, that's not just left, right, but also upstairs, downstairs. Uh, the kind of places that do this type of work are acoustical consulting companies. And what you see here, these logos are all over the country from Ascentec and CTA in the Boston area, Arup Acoustic Distinctions and Cerami in the New York City area. Uh, Eva actually interned at Cerami uh, the previous summer. Uh, the ones on the right hand side like Veniklausen are in California, SSA, one of those S's stands for Seattle, and Tulaski and Threshold there in the middle are actually in the Chicago area. So there's a, a great deal of work in this area as well. Next slide. Musical acoustic design. We've had people go to work at Steinway and Sons right there in Astoria, Queens, New York. They still make them by hand. Uh, Diderio guitar strings. Van Doren Reeves is out on Long Island. Uh, Command Guitar right here in Connecticut. That's a picture of a former uh, recent graduate who was doing a vibration analysis on a Yamaha folk guitar for one of his senior projects. Each one of those white dots is a vibration measurement location to determine just how helpful the soundboard was at reinforcing the sounds of the strings for one of his capstone projects not too long ago. Next slide. So if architectural was everything indoors, this category is everything outdoors. So environmental acoustics covers noise from airports, the highway noise barriers you've driven by in Connecticut or in the whatever state you're from. Uh, all of these topics are never gonna go away because what used to be farmland is now suburbs and people are getting closer and closer together. So these problems are not going to go away. These are also acoustical consulting companies that do this type of work. And they're also located uh, across the country. Lewis Goodfriend and Associates is in New Jersey. Sextant down there in the bottom right is in Pittsburgh. Uh, the Department of Transportation up in the upper left is in Boston. Uh, bottom left is in Dallas, Texas. Wiley is in Virginia. They're all over the country. And again, the demand is quite high. So are the projects that we do in this area as well. Next slide. When we cross over into the bioacoustics area as well, doing hearing aid design at places like Starkey, uh, medical ultrasound, as well as psychoacoustics and sound quality. This past spring, we just finished a capstone project with Starkey hearing aids. It was a marvelous project. And in fact, the students are preparing a paper for presentation at a conference. So this kind of uh, work goes on and you know, the whole essence of this category is helping people, whether it's to help them hear better or to understand sound better or to peer inside uh, when mother is about to give birth to see if the umbilical cord is wrapped around the neck or if it's going to come out feet first. Uh, all of these things are here to help people have better lives. And our last category is product noise control. So this is noise control itself where you have companies that are big enough that actually have their own acoustics department as part of what they do. So Pratt & Whitney jet engines, of course there's mechanical engineers doing better fuel consumption, more power, but there's an entire department that just works on how do we make these things quieter. Car companies like Ford, Nissan, GM, Honda, we have graduates at those companies and all of those companies have NVH or noise, vibration, and harshness departments that are tasked with designing the cars to ride super smooth, be very quiet on the inside, and have an incredible sound system. Or in the case of the picture with the, the uh, Ford Mustang, 
maybe it isn't supposed to be quiet on the inside so that the driver gets that experience of the uh, growling V8 engine. There's also companies that make acoustical products like Soundcoat, USG, and RPG. And then in the upper right is General Dynamics. That's the parent company of Electric Boat. So right here in Groton, New London, Connecticut, our entire submarine fleet is designed and built. And very special department within that company is the ship signatures department. That's their acoustics department that determines how to make sonar work for the Navy so that when they send out a ping, if it reflects off of another submarine, they can actually tell what country that sub's from, how fast the other sub is going, and in what direction. That's signal processing uh, at an incredible level, and that's the kind of acoustics that our graduates do. So those six areas, as I said, you don't have to know which of the six you're most interested in, because in, in our program for both BSME acoustics and acoustical engineering and music, you take all the same classes in these areas of acoustics, vibrations, and courses, and you'll learn about all six and determine which is your favorite. Be glad to answer any questions uh, at the end of the presentation. Great, thanks, Dr. Bob. Just want to add that his students on his uh, capstone design projects go to these national conferences, present, and they kick butt. They beat these <laughs> masters and PhD students. Uh, his undergraduate students do awesome work. You got it. Thanks, man. All right, we have Dr. Ying Yu. He's going to talk to you both about electrical and computer engineering. She's the chair of the department. Okay, everybody, I assume you can hear me, right? Okay, so um, first thing I want to talk about uh, how you differentiate electrical engineering and computer engineering. Um, from experience, we know that it's uh, a bit confusing for high school students. And uh, I also want to just briefly mention that, uh, you know, how to differentiate the computer engineering from computer science, okay? So let's start with the uh, um, electrical engineering. You see that on the diagram, on the left side of the spectrum, right? You have BSEE, -E, okay? That's a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. On the right hand, you have uh, the Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering, okay? That's the two degrees that's hosted in the ECE department. And you can see that the subjects, right? The commonly associated with uh, electrical engineering, you think about electric utility, right? Like Eversource, okay, who provide you power. And of course the internet company, right? Power electronics, okay? And the industrial controls, electronics fabrication, all the consumer electronics, you think about that, right? And of course, you know, the communication systems and the signal processing, right? And uh, in the middle, you have robotics. Robotics is really multidisciplinary. Think about that, okay? It doesn't just include uh, electrical or computer. It also includes uh, mechanical, computer science, etc. But we put it in the middle in the sense that, uh, you know, it's uh, something that really is half hardware, half software, okay? If it's more electrical and computer oriented. And then you, you see that uh, toward the right end of spectrum, you begin to see some of the stuff that's more associated with computer engineering, okay? So you have network, you have cybersecurity, and you have Internet of Things, and you have the software application side of the things. Um, if you continue to go to the more um, software-oriented side, beyond the computer engineering, then you begin to touch upon, you know, purely database system design, algorithm design, software comparison, et cetera. Then you're in the realm of computer science, right? So now for us, for UHART's electrical and computer engineering, it's hosted in the same department, right? Two different degrees hosted in the same department, share all the same faculty and share all the labs. And I can, um, tell you that recently we hired a lot of new faculty in the area of Internet of Things, cybersecurity and the robotics, because we know that those are the thriving areas, right? And it really also begin to see networking between those sub-disciplines. For example, this morning I had a conversation with Michaela and she, she's not here. She's actually one of the ambassadors who who were at uh, um, Saturday's presentation. I, didn't, I don't know whether some of you might have a chance of talking to her. 
listen to her. So she interned at Eversource, okay? Traditionally an electrical um, engineering company. She's a computer engineering. Why do they want her to be an intern? Because they have a new division where their goal is to make sure that each of their substation has internet connection. And they are really trying to design smart grid, right? Embed internet of things into every electric utility that they can monitor. So think about that. One is really on the left side of spectrum, electric utility. One is on the right, which is internet of things, right? But the two are completely coupled together, okay? And also cybersecurity. People think about, about it as you know, in, encryption. But really, some of the most important national security relied in um, cyber physical security. In other words, they can hack your power grid. Uh, again, this morning, I just happened to hear the news that uh, you know, they are hacking a coffee making machine now. They can literally hack your coffee making machine and uh, uh, hold you to ransom. Okay, think about it. An electrical engineer designed that uh, coffee maker, but now, you know, some hacker can actually ransomware it, okay? Unless you want to buy a new one. I was told uh, some good ones cost hundreds of dollars, you know? So interesting facts about uh, those sub-discipline and eventually they really cannot be on a, you know, one line, one dimension spectrum. They really begin to interconnect with each other, right? So next slide, please. And you also see that uh, we want to tell you about uh, why you hearts electrical and computer engineering, right? Not just in general, why should you choose electrical or computer engineering in the first place? Now in our department, uh, I was telling you that uh, the faculty teach both, which is important. In other words, the faculty are not going to be siloed uh, into just electrical engineering or vice versa, just into computer engineering. They frequently work with students, uh, mentor, students in their capstone projects, in their own research projects uh, in both spectrum, right? So that motivated them to com continue to develop the, their professional, professionally into both areas, not just the siloed into a very narrow area, okay? So use myself as an example. I traditionally deal with signal processing, right? speech processing, but I know that now pattern recognition is really on the rise because it's related to artificial intelligence and the robotics. And recently I realized that the Internet of Things is very interesting. So I worked on, with students on several capstone projects that really interest me. I learned a lot myself and I know that that's a potential research area I'm going to continue to explore, right? And a lot of young faculty that we hired and I noticed that uh, you know, a lot of them as undergraduates, they were traditionally just electrical or just computer. And then they go into robotics, right? Or some of them pick the, an area that's uh, cybersecurity related or network related. And I realized that they all have, but they can all teach fundamental electrical or computer engineering classes, but they can also contribute to up level, you know, graduate level classes. That's the hot new thing. Okay, so now with that said, we do share, you know, also equipments, right? You would uh, see we have uh, shared robotics lab, power lab, automation lab, networking lab, audio recording lab as well, okay? And the maker space that's shared by all the engineering um, disciplines. And the new cybersecurity lab and the Internet of Things lab would be um, in the new building. That's going to be probably in less than two years, right? Um, and we do also have the common industrial advisory board. So those alum really, you know, from all programs work together with our students and our capstone projects always, always have interdisciplinary teams. Okay, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in the next slide. So here are just some examples of capstone projects. I would mainly, you know, separate the capstone projects into two big categories. One is passion projects where our students, you know, they have the idea because since they were very young, you know, like uh, the, the picture on the left, uh, you see the rocket team, okay? So Eric, the one on the left, the blonde, the blonde guy, okay, he really is passionate about rockets, you know, since he was a little kid, right? 
So now rockets are much more sophisticated. It's not just a liquid fueled rocket anymore, right? It has a sophisticated electronic brain that monitor and control everything from launching all the way to how you deploy the parachute and it safely land and you can identify the launch of the rocket, right? And you can retrieve it through the GPS location. So that's his passion project. Okay, none of the faculty motivated him. He just realized that everything he has learned can actually, you know, um, become this awesome, cool capstone project. And uh, what Dave Norris, the one, the student on the right, decided to join him, you know, and he eventually realized that he can apply microprocessor knowledge. He learned the electronics design control systems, along with some fundamental programming he picked up uh, through the four years here. Um, and then you have, uh, you know, um, the second picture on, from the right, uh, from the left, uh, you have Adam. He's a computer engineering, right? But he told me personally, and uh, he just emailed me this morning because uh, he's uh, working at Aero Collins Space. And he's like, uh, you know what? I, when I interviewed for that job, right? He changed the job. He switched from electric boat after one year. And uh, they offered him a higher salary at Collins Aerospace. So he switched after just one year. And I heard his salary that day, I was jealous. You know, I was like, gee, I wish I was young again and I can just, uh, you know, but I love teaching, don't get me wrong, okay? So now he's a computer engineering, but he's the type who actually, you know, he took all the computer science required classes, right? Programming one, two in Java and the uh, data structure, et cetera. But he told me that uh, he loved electronics class, okay? So when he, picked a capstone project, he decided that uh, I'm going to make sure that uh, my capstone is going to, you know, have a lot of electronic uh, design embedded. And he loved motorcycle. And he realized that, oh, those the motorcyclists, you know, if they're getting to a pretty deadly accident, they don't even have time to call 911. Is it possible, you know, my motorcycle would automatically call it for me, send a text message with my GPS location, with the, to the 911 text messaging system. And he did that. He won the expo that, that year, okay? And uh, so very proud of him. And then let me be fast, okay? Because I want to give time to robotics. I look at that robotics lag, I thought about robotics. And you hear more about robotics as a major, but robotics is really everywhere. There's a biomedical robotic, there's mechanical robotics, and there's ECEs robotics, right? So it's really multidisciplinary. But as an EE comp major, you can also focus on more robotics related subjects, okay? And the uh, EE Comp again is uh, those uh, um, programs, students tend to collaborate with other um, students a lot. The one on the right, you see that they collaborated with Biomed several years ago as a, a pretty cool project where they design men mentoring that automatically give you feedback. How well are you doing the CPR, right? So, um, Last slide, I want to just show you a collection of companies that recently hired EE Compi students, right? Some are old traditional Connecticut engineering companies that hire all kinds of mechanical, you know, acoustic, electrical, and computer students. Some are, you know, very specific, like MBC, like Times Microwave Systems, like the ASML company that, you know, pays a lot. And what they do is they don't do um, manufacturing of uh, chips. Instead, they supply the technology to those chip manufacturers, okay? So, um, you know, if you have time, take a screenshot, Google those names, get the idea of what they offer, right? Many of those companies were offer, uh, were kind of mentioned multiple times. They are our major alum base. They, they hire a lot of our students. Okay. So I'm going to say goodbye for now. And if you have a question, please type in the you know, uh, Q&A. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Yu. So I just wanted to sort of breeze through and say that all of these the programs, students do really cool projects. They do a lot of hands-on projects. They do a lot of exciting different applications of the fundamentals that they're learning in the classroom. First year as freshmen, you get your hands dirty. You start off with some simpler projects. Uh, all of our first year students do a robotics project. And as you move through the program, you do cooler and cooler types of hands-on. We try to bring engineering to life. That's a key part of our program. And the person who really does it is uh, 
Dr. Kiwan Son, who's our robotics engineering uh, faculty member. And if we were in person, he would really wow you. Um, but unfortunately, here we are remote, but he's gonna talk to you about our new robotics engineering program. Thank you. Hi, I am Kiwan Son, uh, assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering and also robotics engineering program. Uh, robotics engineering is a new program at UHART. Uh, the main objective of this program is to prepare students to fulfill the growing and expected demands for entry-level position in robotics. Currently, our robotics engineering program focuses on, but not limited to, robot principle design, building, and operation. Therefore, it is highly hands-on program. Robotics is the multidisciplinary engineering field which combines electricity, mechatronics, programming, AI, and machine learning. Therefore, the program takes advantage of our strong offering in various programs in New York, such as computer science program, computer engineering program, electrical engineering program, and also mechanical engineering program. St uh, students will also take the sequence of the robotics engineering course called Robo 1, Robo 2, Robo 3, Robo 4, and Robot Capstone 1, Robot Capstone 2 during sophomore and junior and senior years. And there will be also multiple engineering elective courses available for senior students. As a search, the robotics engineering program covers various aspects of engineering and students in this program will receive more of well-rounded educational experience. Additionally, this program will benefit from uh, many laboratories in Shira, especially the two robotics lab. In this day, uh, we can see application of robotics in nearly every aspect of our lives. Therefore, graduates of this program will be prepared to work for various industries which adopt robotics technology, such as factor automation, advanced manufacturing, automobile, aerospace, defense, security, and even commerce and healthcare companies. Furthermore, with the interdisciplinary knowledge learned in the program, students will be also prepared for various positions in other engineering fields beyond robotics. Oh, next slide, please. Oh, this slide demonstrates uh, demonstrate few examples of the previous projects which our students worked on in the field of robotics. Their research topic was ranged from the simple mobile service robot to bio-inspired quadrupedal robot and even full-sized humanoid robot. Through the project, uh, many students published their research in various international conferences and shared their outcome with engineering societies. In this semester, about 40 students in Shira who are grouped in five different teams are actively building and working on different robot platforms. In this slide, uh, you will be able to see the humanoid in the vehicle on the right side and its zoomed in legs on the left side. The robot's name is Heart Human Assistive Robot and one of its main use case is to drive off the shelf vehicles. The robot is already kinematically tested in various types of vehicles such as kid-sized go-kart, golf cart, and even pickup truck, which is Ford F-150. Last week, our students successfully controlled the robot to drive the vehicle in indoor environment, hallway of our engineering building. After one more experimentation on this Wednesday, our students will move this robot to outdoor environment or campus lawn area and will continue their research. So if you join UHART Engineering School, you will be able to see all these fun robots and work on them. This is everything which I prepared for robotics engineering program today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Sohn. So that, that's a quick snapshot of our seven different engineering programs. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. And I see a few of you have questions, which is great. And I would ask all our panelists actually now, if you don't mind just turning on your cameras so everybody can see you, and then we'll uh, take the questions. And I'm gonna start with, uh, First off, I'm glad you're starting to answer, ask questions because if you were a student at the University of Hartford, that's what you would be doing is asking lots of questions because uh, we have a very friendly environment where we encourage you to participate. So I think I'm gonna take one of them here. 
uh, Alex, and then I'm gonna pass on some of the others to our other panelists. But what makes UHART's engineering programs better than those of other universities across the country? And I'd say one thing is our dedicated faculty who are really interested in helping you out to grow as students and to grow from being an engineering student to a successful professional. We really encourage you to do hands-on projects. So we take what the theory that you learn in the classroom and it's the real challenge of seeing and making something, designing something so it'll do what you want it to do. It's the design aspect and then seeing that through uh, completion of at least building a prototype. Again though, I think if you, if for all of us, we do care about you. It's a team effort. It's not just students and faculty, it's us together. And I think bringing us together with all of our industry contacts and working on these exciting projects that you've just heard about is why you want to come to the University of Hartford and be part of our engineering program. Uh, so thanks, Alex. Thanks for attending. Uh, Jillian, I'm not sure if uh, you guys can see these, uh, but Jillian asks, and I'm not sure how we want to do this, but we'll see. Are there any mentorship programs for students who require guidance within the different engineering programs? If someone wants to take the mentoring uh, question here, should I call on one of our panelists? I want to call on Professor Brown to answer that since he's, uh, he's mentored many uh, young engineers throughout his career. Sure. Um, I, I, I guess I don't fully understand your question, Jillian, but um, I'll answer it a couple of different ways. With, in terms of helping you decide which engineering program uh, is the one for you, uh, this also speaks to one of the uh, other questions that I saw that I don't see right now, and that is how much flexibility is there uh, to change majors after the first year? And there's a lot of flexibility. We, we purposely try to keep our first year uh, curriculum very similar, not identical, but very similar across all the programs, so that if you do want to change after that first year, you can do so with some fairly minor modifications of the standard curriculum for whatever program you're transferring into. So during that freshman year, you will be taking a um, engineering and design class where you will start to build some projects. Uh, you're given a robot in your first class and you'll do some projects on your own with that robot and you'll do some team projects and you'll learn a little bit about programming, a little bit about putting robots together and a little bit about all the disciplines of engineering. So there's that mentoring by that instructor. As Dr. Pine said, all of us are in this business of teaching students because we like students, because we like to share our expertise and we wanna see you succeed. Um, and I think that is part of what sets us apart. At least uh, some of us do research. I'm not one of them, I am not a researcher. I'm a practitioner and I'm focused on helping you become a practitioner. Um, and you don't get a lot of that at other universities. In terms of mentoring all the way through a given program um, and coaching you toward a career, uh, many of us in this, in this college have worked professionally uh, as engineers. Dr. Pines worked professionally before he went to get his PhD. Um, you know, many of my colleagues have done so. And we can share our experience with you and we can help you understand what it takes to become a successful engineer. Um, and I've probably talked long enough. And if I didn't answer your question, Jillian, please elaborate and we'll try again. Thanks. Great, thanks, thanks, Todd. Um, Mirandi says, what facilities are shared among the different arms of the engineering disciplines? So there's so many different people who could answer that because the electrical, mechanical, biomedical, computer, are, and robotics are so interrelated that they have to cross over. Um, I'm not sure if one of you guys would like to take that question. No. How about Dr. Asaki? you got your hands in everything. So we can talk about how biomeds and electrical engineering work together. Uh, you probably work with the mechanical engineering department. So I'll let you take that one. Yes, we do. The, our biomed has like a mechanical aspects to begin with. 
So we had Mechanics of Material Lab. So we share the mechanical testing lab, which mechanical engineers and civil engineering also use same testing lab. And then uh, also the biomed have a circuit electronics class. So that's ECE class, the circuits lab, and that facility they have. So we kind of go back and forth here and there. And then also I believe mechanical also taking circuits class. Then circuits class is also ECE. And then ECE students taking you know, mechanical class, which you know, engineering mechanics class. So it's really hybrid between basic science, basic engineering topics left to right. Yeah, so just to add sort of my background is I was an undergraduate chemical engineer. I have a master's in mechanical and a PhD in environmental. So I'm a little bit mixed up. Uh, so thermal fluids is sort of my, the area that I'm interested in and that sort of glues it all together. But I really think you're an engineer first. And that's what we really stress It's the basic engineering. And then you go off into your different areas, but you really have to be that engineer first in learning how to solve problems. And I think, again, we have a great collaborative team so that we all work together well. And so you can go from one area to the other, regardless of what your major is. Um, we, we have a nice tight group, nice engineering program. Uh, you learn from so many different people. Uh, it's a very exciting and vibrant environment. Uh, Matt had asked about, is the robotics major accredited by ABET? Uh, Dr. Yu, can you handle that one? It will be once we have uh, the first graduate. I think uh, we only started uh, um, uh, recruiting students uh, last year and uh, some students actually switched into it after they know that, oh, it's created. So it's definitely designed, the whole curriculum is designed to be accredible and uh, uh, accreditable. And you see that at the moment we um, are going to produce our first graduate, this is when we are eligible for accreditation. I think it will probably be in two, three years because we already have students who are freshmen, right, Dave? Yes. Sounds good. Uh, and then I guess another one for you is what's the difference between computer engineering and computer engineering technology? Oh, well, that difference is a little bit subtle in the sense that uh, you would see that if you look at their curriculum, right, you do see that, oh, they both have a microprocessor. Um, they both uh, are required to take some programming related classes. But the computer engineering, after all, is engineering. So you are required to take uh, more, you know, advanced mathematics, okay? And uh, some of the graduate level classes uh, you are required to take do require you to have those advanced mathematics, right? While computer engineering technology, um, we actually only have computer and electronic engineering technology, okay? So that program is more application-based, right? So you see that uh, maybe the upper-level class you take uh, is uh, RF communication, okay? Um, and you might also take uh, robotics, but the robotics is different from the engineering robotics, right? You, you can also to intro to robotics, but Professor Song uh, can actually talk more. You know, you probably would learn computer interface and you would learn networking, okay? It's a lot of application-based hands-on um, classes. Instead of uh, engineering, sometimes you dovetail with computer science, you dovetail with electrical engineering. Does it kind of answer your uh, question, I hope? Great, thanks. Uh, I know Jonathan had asked previously, I had typed an answer to him about the acoustics engineering and music program and the acoustics concentration. And then he says, in this question, I mainly play classical music. I recently started to explore jazz. Uh, maybe Dr. Bob, you can talk a little bit more about those options and Sean and Eva, if you'd like to chime in too, uh, that would be great. So those are the two genres that we have over at the Hart School. So the whole program that we have in acoustical engineering and music is done in cooperation with our music conservatory on campus, which is called the Hart School, H-A-R-T-T. -T. And so that program does require a music audition and the two 
genres that you can audition in are either classical or jazz. All right, and I think uh, Eva, you, you are part of the Acoustical Engineering and Music program. Uh, you want to like to say a few words about that? Sure, so yeah, as has been said, I do a place classical trombone. Um, overall, I find the program to be a really great mix of um, doing all the engineering that I classes that I really love, but also still having that ability to um, have my music passions and do things like that. Like right now, I am doing research that's kind of based in psychoacoustics, but kind of also based in uh, music. I took a class on video game music. Um, was a music history class as an elective last year. And so I'm doing research based on that. So it has the acoustics aspect of it and it has some of the music aspect of it and some of the history based things that we learn in the heart school. And so just the ability to have this program, it's unique to the University of Hartford, which is why I ended up here um, because it's the only program that actually allows you to do engineering and music at the same time. And it really works very well together and I quite enjoy it. Great, thanks. And how about Sean? You want to talk about how you got into the acoustic concentration part of mechanical engineering? Sure. So um, I'm a mechanical engineer with a concentration in acoustics. And I really got there because I did have an interest in music, but I felt like I wanted to go deeper into the engineering side and uh, maybe uh, audio engineering wasn't for me. So I did my research and I found the acoustics program at UHART. And looking at the program, it turned out to be the perfect balance of all the important engineering things, statics, dynamics, materials, but then you also get that acoustic side, which you will cover things about music. Uh, I'm a music person at heart, but I, not not at the school heart, but at, like my actual heart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and so I so even as a mechanical engineer, I do get to also follow my passion as I am learning a lot about instruments and uh, sound, and I have had experiences where I'm able to kind of dive into the musical side of acoustics. I participated in a concert hall research group last year where I stayed a week, like a week long uh, sleepaway camp where I sat with a bunch of industry professionals and talked about the current state of concert hall design, which is very musical, but then that also implements a lot of uh, the engineering side. So even if you are interested in music, you don't, you do get a lot of flavor of music when you're not a music person, but as a mechanical engineer, I do have a lot of uh, my feet in both pools. How about a little bit about your summer internship you just did? Right, so um, this past summer, I interned at Carrier in Indianapolis. Uh, that was awesome. That was uh, more of the engineering side of things, but I mainly participated in the laboratory environment where I was helping develop procedures for uh, kind of sound quality uh, assessment of HVAC, like air conditioners and fans and all the units that Carrier makes. And I was helping about procedures determining uh, vibration assessment to see if the amount of movement that the, fake, that the fan makes will cause any damage to the unit, how loud it is. Is the sound pleasing to uh, the consumer? So um, that is the other side of experience I have where I had experience in the very musical side also have experienced the very engineering side. So I do have um, a good flavor of both, which is a great thing to know once you're a senior and you don't know what you want to do in life, it's good to have that experience. Great, thanks, Sean. I guess we'll, we'll do one more from Jonathan. Uh, this is probably the Eva. Uh, I think our, what's the, uh, I think he had asked about, now I can't see it, of course, uh, the balance between your engineering and music classes. Yeah, so I had just sent him a message, but I can okay. talk for everyone on the panel too, because who knows, someone else might be interested. I find that it's not too overwhelming. There's definitely some times where you'll have an ensemble that might have an issue with a class. So sometimes scheduling can be a little bit difficult, but people are really good about it. You can always make it work. And I haven't had any problems with that as long as you just talk to people about it, if it's ever a problem. Um, but Overall, like I still have time. I'm in a bunch of different clubs. I'm starting a new club this year. Um, I have a job on campus. And so I'm just, you know, I'm still doing things. I'm able to do outside of school things as well as balancing my engineering and my music classes and still doing well in all of it. So I think it's definitely doable. It just takes time management, but I think all of engineering is like that. Great. Thanks. And, and we do, we really encourage you to be holistic students. It's not just engineering. I think the more different activities and experiences you get involved in, 
uh, just the better person you are and more experiences will turn you into a better engineer. Uh, so if anybody's interested in international projects, that would be up my line. That was a plug for myself. Uh, but I'm gonna turn this one over to Dr. Yavuz Turk about what is the balance for professors' time between research and undergraduate teaching? Oh, that's a good one. There's another one from Jillian Farino uh, uh, about the classes being more hands-on versus, uh, versus more like lecture. Maybe I'll take both of them. Sounds good. Uh, so to answer Jillian's question, I was just typing it actually. <clears throat> Uh, it depends on the class. It depends on the course. If, if, if it's a course that's dealing with uh, you needing to, well, if it's dealing with engineering and science, engineering science fundamentals, then yes, it's more of a, more of a lecture course. But there are a, a, quite a number of courses, lecture type courses that have uh, labs attached to them. So not only are you then learning the, uh, uh, the theoretical uh, underpinnings of, let's say, uh, mechanics of materials, but at the same time, you're taking a, a, a lab-based course to actually, uh, to actually, you know, uh, break some materials and, and, and to learn uh, uh, to learn how the materials uh, behave under stress, for example. So it does it does depend on the course, right? There's a, there's a fairly good mix of uh, lecture-based courses and, and, and lab-based courses. So in terms of the balance for professors' time between research and undergraduate teaching, uh, uh, we are not like a, a, a large uh, state school where graduate students do the teaching for us. We do the, we do the teaching ourselves. Uh, uh, yes, we do, you know, uh, we do have uh, research projects that we work on, but teaching comes first for us, for all of us. Uh, and and that, that's the fundamental uh, differentiator between a school like University of Hartford and, and, and maybe larger, uh, larger schools around us where, uh, you know, graduate students may be the ones teaching the lectures, labs, and many other uh, many, many other tasks that professors ourselves do here. So, uh, so in terms of time, uh, we're, we're primarily a teaching institution, uh, even though we do, we do uh, quite a bit of research, uh, most of our time is spent on teaching. Right, and we do encourage undergraduate research. Uh, we do have, since we do have a master's program, uh, but we really want our undergraduates to get to know the faculty members because that many of them are doing our research in the labs or applied research and we want to get undergraduates involved in that. Uh, so part of it is being outgoing as a student, getting to know your instructors uh, during normal times, knocking on our doors in our office. Most of them are already open the doors, getting to know us. And when there's an opportunity that comes our way, that's who we think about are the students that who took the time to say hi to us. Doesn't always have to be the 4.0 GPA student. It's a student that's interested in what we're doing because they're interested in the same type of subjects. Uh, Dr. Sohn has lots of students interested in what he's doing. He's got a great robotics club because he shows so much enthusiasm and students flock to that. It becomes a, a tremendous opportunity for our undergraduate students. Let me see, do we have any, I guess, we've answered a bunch of questions, I guess. Are there any other questions or do you think uh, we need any follow-up? Uh, what's great is that if you do have questions, uh, we would love, I'm not sure how you can visit campus these days uh, with the whole COVID, it makes it more difficult. But anytime you need more information, please con connect with Evan. Uh, Evan is our, uh, maybe Evan would like to say a few words about how students could connect with you if they have more questions and how they could reach out to the faculty or students directly. Uh, we're always open and willing to discuss uh, what we do at the university, what we do in the College of Engineering, Technology, and Architecture, primarily because we love what we do. We love to talk about it. We could keep you here all night. 
<laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so for those of you uh, that haven't met me yet, my name is Evan Holliday. I'm the manager of collegiate admission and retention uh, for the College of Engineering, Technology and Architecture. And I will be your main point of contact from here uh, until you decide to apply, until you decide to deposit, until you attend. Uh, I will be the person that will work with you on any question that you might have, and then I will distribute those questions out to all the faculty, all the students, and all the staff you see here, uh, if I cannot personally answer them, or if you want to speak to one of them personally. Um, so I believe Stephanie just linked my personal information, as well as some of our tour options on campus in the chat box, so feel free to check that out. Um, you can contact me anytime at cedainfo at hartford.edu. I wrote that in the chat, but it's also on the page that Stephanie linked. Uh, and, um, you know, moving forward, uh, any questions about wanting to set up uh, a visit on campus, we are, we are doing limited CETA tours right now. So if you're interested in doing that, uh, you can uh, contact me. You can go to the registration page on our website. I would be happy to help with that. Um, and uh, anything at all, I'm, I'm here to help. And I was really uh, happy to sit in today and, and see all the faculty present. I think it was great. So thank you, Professor Pines, for this. It was wonderful. Great. Thanks. And thanks to you to all our uh, faculty, panelists, students. Uh, I just want to let this, the prospective students know, you know, we're proud of what we do at the University of Hartford. Uh, we think we have a great program that really benefits the students that come to our college. Uh, we want you to be successful. Uh, we really are interested in what you do, not only during your time here at the university, we want to make sure you get those experiences that you need to find what you want to do in life. It's all about finding your passion. And if you can find your passion, you will be successful. And we really are here to achieve that. That's what makes us, you know, when we go home and sleep at night and knowing that we are happy and excited about what we do, it's because we've provided our students an opportunity to find what they want to do. So again, thank you for attending the session. Uh, happy to answer any other questions or whatever your, wherever your college search brings you. Great. All right, are you gonna say goodbye, Evan, or how do we end this? <laughs> oh no, I, that, that was a perfect goodbye. And uh, you know, for, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have done it any better myself. Um, I just didn't want to hit the kill button before it. <laughs> just <laughs> before it's um, no, well, I figured we should say, just in case, a couple other people might stay behind and ask some questions, so I'll hang out. Um, but uh, for those of you that uh, just uh, for your kind words in the Q and A, we really appreciate you coming out. Uh, love to see feedback from students; that's really helpful. So, uh, thank you. I'm really glad that this was a, a very informative and helpful session. And like I said, hopefully, we see all of you apply uh, very soon. So yeah. that's all I have to say. All right. Thanks, Nick, Eileen, and Julian. Thank you very much for the nice Thank words. You. Have a good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Take care. Really nice work, everybody. Really nice. All right. So yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, students, for chipping in. Uh, hopefully, it went well. Uh, so it did. Time, so. I I think that was excellent. Um, that was. I just want I just want you to know, like, for for a virtual session to go as smoothly as that just did, like, no no like hangups. Uh, everything, everything just went together nicely. Everybody had really nice things to say. Um, like I've never seen so many students like say that they actually enjoyed a presentation. So that alone is very telling. So that is really good. So that was great. Thank you, Professor Pines, for leading that. You did a really great job. Excellent. I just had my one when Dr. Bob was presenting my for whatever reason, all the presenters were on the screen and I couldn't see.